The subject came up with Simon Webb yesterday of torture in Ireland during the 1970s. Now, the problem is that had Simon chosen to roll the clock back yet another 50 years in Ireland, he'd find that wasn't something new there. I could roll it back another 100 years even further, but for today, we'll roll it back to the Irish War of Independence and we'll roll it that far. I don't think most people in Britain really learn a great deal about the Irish War of Independence or are really all that well aware of it. Um, I've covered this subject when this channel was new. Here's the Black and Tans. If I use this word in Ireland and start going on about the Black and Tans, you will still soon find people going on about... Well, let's just say the reactions won't be very nice. There's still older people who will be spitting or be annoyed by them. If I praise them, I'd best be leaving the room very quickly and at high speed. Um, this article is from RTE and was written as part of the Atlas of the Irish Revolution, which can be bought in a very large book. I actually own this very large book, and it's so large that you could basically throw it at planets and lock them out of orbits. Um, this article is by Mary Coleman, Queen's University, Belfast. Let me go through a bit of it. Over 10,000 auxiliaries and black and tan served in Ireland between 1920 and 22. There is a tendency in Ireland to use the term auxiliaries and black and tans interchangeably. They're not the same thing. The black and tans were recruited mainly from servicemen and NCOs, not officers, and they were recruited earlier in the conflict. Though, contrary to popular repute, they were not all ex-prison birds or jailbirds, as was put about. This was propaganda that was used to smear them, as each side had its own wonderful propaganda in the era. And the article notes it as we go on. On average, the auxiliaries were older, 29 years, and the tans 26 years old, which is not surprising, as the auxiliaries were mostly officers, and they were mostly from a higher social class. They were also considered more deadly because they were more organised and more educated. Historian D.M. Lurson has effectively contradicted the traditionally derogatory view of these men's ex-convicts and psychopaths hardened by prison and war crazed by war. In fact, very few had criminal records and prior to the First World War had served in a range of occupations. An analysis of one cohort of 19 auxiliaries who were ambushed by the IRA at Clonfin in County Longford in February 1921, resulting in the deaths of four of them, reveals that their average age was 26, 95% were Protestants, 14 Anglicans, three Presbyterians and one Baptist, the only non-Protestant being a Scottish Catholic. Only three had pre-war armed force service, one in the army and two in the navy. Other occupations included an actor, a teacher, engineers, and mechanics, shop assistants, messengers, and clerks. This is a men's street station, which is now Connolly Station in Dublin. Um, this is a, a lorry load of auxiliaries. Anyone Irish will probably get that one. Or a, or a lorry load of tans, if you like. While the overall majority of both forces were English, the Clonfig cohort included two Scots, a Welshman, and a South African. I'm not sure how that South African got there. Must have kind of been a bit far from home. The latter is believed to have participated in the Boer War on the South African side, while one of his auxiliary comrades was a British Army veteran of the same conflict. And this sort of mixed loyalty of strange people floating from side to side is all part of the, of the game of this era and the history of it. The previous military and combat experiences of both forces raised questions about their preparedness for adapting to the guerrilla warfare conditions which they faced in Ireland. Historian A.D. Harvey identified the Royal Air Force as the organisation which the larger single group of officers had belonged. Yes, certainly the ideal force to belong to when you're going to get involved in a guerrilla war. <laughs> Perhaps not, um, no, with no slight to the RAF. While historian Andrew Nelson has shown that the combat experience of more than half of the auxiliary company ambushed at Kill Michael in County Cork in November 2020 was exclusively in trench warfare, the lack of, this lack of ex adequate experience was compounded by inadequate training with fatal consequences in some cases. The majority of the auxiliaries involved in the ambushes at Clonfin and Kill Michael had less than two months' service in Ireland. And so basically, they didn't know local conditions whatsoever. And Kilmichael is infamous, as anyone Irish hearing this will know, 
for being where one of the largest successful raids on uh, occurred in during the Irish War of Independence with a near total wipeout of a column. Motivations for joining included the difficulty readjust, readjusting to civilian life after the Great War, the opportunity to experience the camaraderie of being part of an armed force again, and not surprisingly, the economic benefits of a well remunerated job. We know unemployment among ex servicemen in Britain was high. William Bellerman, who was wounded at Clonfin, stated that he joined the auxiliaries merely to tide him over the crisis in the engineering trade. You'll find if you look at the auxiliaries, people of all sorts of ranks from sort of sub lieutenants, second lieutenants, right up to sort of quite senior ranks like Brigadier General joined them just because there were no jobs with the collapse in the economy after World War I. In spite of their Irish experience, the desire to continue in uniform clearly remained with some. Disbanded auxiliaries and tans served in the British Palestinian Gendarmerie and other colonial forces, where some XRC were set, resettled after the force was disbanded in 1922. The British Palestinian General and Army gained a, shall we say, a particular reputation. I might do something about them later. However, here's a book. This book is by Oni O'Malley. Oni O'Malley was one of the most successful IRA commanders during the War of Independence. And Oni O'Malley is not given to exaggeration. Some people who do give their accounts of the War of Independence on both sides are given to, to be polite, hyperbole. But here we go. As I swayed to my feet, on my feet, I could see their faces jump back, forward and back like land seen under hot sun as through hot sm through tin smoke. The blood in my eyes made the room a distorted jumble of reds and blues. A hot, salty taste of warm blood flows down my throat and through my lips when I took breath. My tongue seemed to loosen my teeth, which were now as big as fingers when pressed on them. My nose was pushed silent, uh, aslant. I snored when I exhaled. This is an account of basically Ernie getting beaten up by British officers up at Dublin Castle and getting the crap knocked out of him. This was not an unusual occurrence. If you go back a few pages, you'll find them talking about... Oh, let's see if I can find the page. Oh, yep, here we go. Ernie was imprisoned with Brother Dominic, who served as the chaplain to... Terence McSweeney, who was on hunger strike. And Dominic notes he knows in this room that Dick McKee and Peter were murdered. These two individuals were infamously tortured to death and basically returned to the uh, for burial in a condition that's quite shocking. I've seen their bodies on post-mortem photos, and it's plain the torture was severe and really very extensive. I wouldn't share the photos because if I was to do so... YouTube would instantly ban me that that disturbing and unpleasant. It's this sort of thing that made the fighting <laughs> seem such a nasty quality as the War of Independence moved on to its final stages. Nor am I going to pretend it was a one-way street. There were, um, you had the, uh, torture in use by both sides, and when it moved on to the Civil War afterwards, you had the wonderful example of people being blown up at Ballycidi by being tied to mines. We had some really silly comments on that video by Webb about, oh, it doesn't matter because they're just terrorists. The problem with that is once you start that, of course, you've, prov you've created a load of Mars and kept the war going forever. And I think, to be fair to Simon, that was the point he was trying to make. That that sort of situation would just result in an endless spiral of violence that would never end. As you saw in Northern Ireland, it just went round and round and round. Each side just found new tactics to use that were deeply unpleasant. I'm going to include a few links. Only Amali's book there is on Internet Archive, which is highly recommended if you want to look up books on just about anything, although you do have to make a free account to book books out. And sometimes, as with this book, you have to redo it every couple of hours to keep reading, but that's not a big deal. You can also find books to download sometimes and keep as PDF files. It's a hugely useful resource. 
here you have History Island telling you more about the Black and Tans. There is a whole history of this stuff going right back to 1798 with pitch caps and so on. It's not a simple subject. And I understand that Simon was only trying to cover a small period. But I felt it deserved a little bit more attention. So there's a bit more info on it that might interest people.